So last week, we started chapter 5. We began our study in chapter 5, and we, if you wanted to turn there, that's never a bad idea. We're going to have the verses referred to here on the screen. Let me encourage you, if you have your paper Bible or a, a device or whatever, follow along. As we always say here at the gathering, let the Bible define what the Bible is saying. And so we're looking at Romans chapter 5. Just look at verse 1. This is the verse that we started with last week. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Paul writes, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, since we have believed on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the means by which God the Father has covered our sin and forgiven us of all our unrighteousness, Therefore, we have now been declared completely blameless before God. That's justified. Being seen by him just as if we have never sinned. And we've now been taken in from the category of the wicked and placed into the category of the righteous by God himself. This is something he has done. We are now at peace with God by God's own determination. We know we are sinners. But when we receive our Lord Jesus Christ, and believe that his death paid for our sin, God says, I see that faith, and I give you righteousness, just like he gave Father Abraham. And we saw that in the scripture. What does it mean to have peace with God? It means we're no longer his enemy. We're no longer separated from him and under his wrath. But we now live in a love relationship with him. We are now his adopted children. As we saw last week in the book of Malachi, we are now his treasured possession. And our names have been recorded in front of God in the Lamb's book of life. And to top that all off, Paul says, jump down to verse 5. We have been given God's Holy Spirit into our hearts as a sign of God's own guarantee that we've been saved. And that we're being saved. And that we will be saved. We're to no longer fear the wrath that is to come. Because we've been for completely forgiven. And how did we receive all this? As we see in this verse, verse 1 and verse 5, we see it's by faith. Not by anything we've done. Not by our works at all. Not even by our heritage, our ancestry. If we're related to Father Abraham in any way, that doesn't do anything towards our forgiveness for sin. It's solely received by faith, from the grace of God, by faith. Simply believing. Honestly, what is faith? Faith is just saying amen, as we saw. Saying amen to God. God's the one who said it. God's the one who promises. We just say amen to him and believe what he has said. And we believe that his son accomplished it all on the cross for us. We are then assured of our salvation. Now, I want to stop before we break down what we're going to see in our verses and chapters in chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, before we start breaking down that passage, we need to really grasp where the Apostle Paul is going here and talking about this idea of eternal security because he states it as a fact. We now have peace with God. And the question is, does he mean forever? Is that what the Bible says? Because you see, there are many blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ that struggle with this reality. Is this what God's word says or not? Is this saying, once saved, always saved? Is it truly a dividing line that separates people within God's church body? What does the Bible say about this topic? And as we looked briefly last week, I want us to look again at these verses. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And we'll see how this applies to Romans chapter 5 in just a moment where we are. But I want us to fill our minds again with what we've talked about. What the Bible is saying before us. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 through 5 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Verse 5. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith. For a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Look there at verse 3. At the end of verse 3 it says, according to God's great mercy, he has caused us 
to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Who causes all who believe in Jesus to be born again? God does, right? He's the one who causes us to be born again. How does he do it? According to this verse. He does it through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In other words, through the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power is what God uses to cause us to be born again. That power is now in us. So let me ask you this question. Can Jesus ever die again after he's been raised? No. He lives ever, never to die again. And we need to understand this. That same power that's in Jesus then is now in us who believe. Can we, who have been born again by that same power, ever spiritually die and be separated from God again? No, because it's all God and not us. In fact, Jesus says that himself. Go to John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. We want to nail this down. Because we can't go where Paul is taking us in Romans chapter 5 without fully understanding what we've already said and what we've already talked about. And so Jesus tells Martha, on his way to raise Lazarus from physical death, verse 25 in John 11, Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked this question, do you believe this? See, the only way that Jesus can make such an strange, crazy, bold claim is if he's the one who's going to fulfill it. If, if he is truly the resurrection and the life, then he can make this promise. Because I can promise all that I want to that my wife will do something. It's, she's, it's still up to her. Many times we've had interesting discussions. I'm, I'm sure it never happens in your family, but in our family, we're strange. I might say, yeah, my wife will be happy to do that for you, and I get home, and she says, I'm sorry, what? But Jesus is able to say, whoever believes in me, though he physically die, he will never, ever spiritually die. Why? Because he's the resurrection and the life. So if we're born again and God's Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, Paul refers to it as, now lives in us, we can't ever lose it. Because it's by the power of God that we are saved. We just receive by saying, amen, God, this is what is true. Go back to 1 Peter and look at verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. God is so sure that he's able to save us and keep us in him that he says, and I've got this great inheritance waiting for you. Look at he says, it is God who is keeping an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. God's not only prepared us for heaven, but he has given his own eternal life into us so that God has prepared us to be with him forever. He's prepared us for heaven and he's got a an amazing, beyond what we can ever imagine, inheritance waiting for us in heaven as well. That's with him. And this inheritance we have, it'll never waste away. It'll never be contaminated by sin. It'll never lose the glory that God has given it. So let's think about this in in human terms for a moment. How many of you have taken a bus here in Southwest Asia? Southeast Asia, I should say. All right. Anybody taken a bus? When you've taken that bus, the odds are pretty good, yes or no, on the front of the bus, it told you where the bus was going, right? Okay. And on the side of the bus, it has the bus number that matches your ticket, so you don't get on that bus unless you know where it's going. But if you see that the bus says it's going to the place you want to go, you get on it in faith, knowing, trusting that that bus will take you there. Now, it's, of course, a physical bus, and they don't always make that destination, but think of it this way. What if God is the bus owner, and God's the one who has determined that this bus is going there, and as you get to the door, the doors open up, and it is Jesus driving the bus, and the one who gave you the ticket is the Holy Spirit, who not only gave you the ticket, but is with you, helping you get on the bus, and is getting on the bus with you, how sure can you be you'll make the destination? Because that's what 
The word of God is saying. If it's God who saves us, we just receive that forgiveness. If it's God who gives us rebirth, new birth in him, by the power of God's resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and now we're with him, and he's in us, God gave his best in his son, and now he's giving us his best in his Holy Spirit, aren't we assured of the journey? Yes, because it's all what God is doing. And that's what verse 5 is there in 1 Peter chapter 1. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We are being guarded by this power of God, and that God power has a name. It's the Holy Spirit in us and with us. It is God himself. Because what if my faith fails? What if I believe, but now I struggle and I doubt? No, we're being guarded. If that faith was genuine in Jesus Christ, you've been born again. And the Bible says, later on in chapter 8, we'll get there. The Holy Spirit inside of you is telling you, you're my child. It's God himself saying, don't worry, my child. Just continue to trust me. For I'm holding you even when you fall. Even in those seasons of doubt and times of heartache, when you feel I'm not there, I am always with you. I will always return. You will always return to me because I'm holding on to your faith and you are mine. And this brings us now in preparation for Romans chapter 5. Let's go back to Romans chapter 5 now. And let's continue on in verses 6 through 11. And look what God has for us this morning from our passage today. That's all introduction to get us where God wants us to help us to understand. Romans chapter 5, let's read verses 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We're going to break that down this morning. Let's look at verse 6. The very beginning, let's look what he says. He says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. What was the condition of mankind at this moment which was the right time, and Jesus died for us. What was our condition? We were still weak. Some of your translations say helpless. Other translations say without strength. Those are great translations. That word in the Greek literally means completely unable. Having an absolute inability, strengthless. We were completely unable by our own ability to purchase forgiveness from God, is what it's saying. And God paid for our sins with the blood of his son. Verse 6 says we were still weak and we were ungodly. Verse 8 says we were still sinners. Verse 10 says we were enemies of God. We were separated from God, deserving only God's holy wrath and judgment, and completely helpless and incapable of doing anything about it to change our situation. And it was then, at that point, that God determined that was the right time. He didn't wait for us to get to a point where we could be good enough. He didn't demand these things be accomplished before he sent his son. No, while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies and separated from God and under his wrath, while we were still weak and ungodly, that was the right time. And Jesus Christ died for us. Look at verses 7 and 8. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, it was when we were helpless and ungodly and sinners that was the right time. Why? Because at that moment, it was the most perfect time for us to see the love that God has for us. 
God shows his love. His love was made manifest for us. It was revealed. It's like going to one of those fancy restaurants with the big silver top over the food, and it, they bring the food, and then they pull the top off with a flourish, and it reveals what the food is. That's the word here. God reveals his love for us, not in that waiting for us to do good, but no, while we were still sinners, and that's very important for us to understand because you know what? It's easy for us, as the scripture says here, to imagine being Loving to someone who's good. We can imagine ourselves helping people that we love. I'm reminded of a time when our daughters were 9 and 10. We were living in Central Asia as well. And we took a vacation to Koh Samui, Thailand. We were going to go on a boat tour. And we're walking on the dock. My daughters are in front of me. Julie and I are side by side as we're walking. And out of the side of my eye, I see this dog barreling straight at Jamie, my youngest daughter. Snarling, teeth bared, fully intent to attack Jamie. And I didn't know what to do. But I did know this. That's my daughter. And I'm going to love her and protect her as best that I can. So at the last moment, I stepped forward and I punched the dog in the head as hard as I could. Praise the Lord, it was a small dog. It only took one punch for it to change its mind and go off yelping back where it was. Now, I'm no hero. I, my daughters thought I was pretty cool. But all I did was love someone that I love. Protect someone that is precious to me and valuable to me. That's been a gift from God given to us. And you would do the same. I'm sure you have stories in your own life of how you have protected and provided for your kids. For those parents and the ones you love. But what if that person wasn't my daughter? What if the dog was chasing someone who had just hurt my daughter or stolen my wife's purse? And I watched the dog chase that person. Would I stop the dog then? Or would I cheer it on? Go get him or her. See, our motivation of love is usually based upon the object of our love. And it's usually based upon how we feel for that person. We love the ones we love and we hate the ones we hate. Because we respond differently when we see somebody who we feel deserves the punishment. Our response is different, about, different for those that break the law, hurt children, who break up families, who abuse the helpless. We rise in anger against those who lead governments into war or treat their own people with contempt and violence and even murder. We feel no love at all for those who openly hate the name of Jesus Christ and persecute his church and kill his children. And we feel anger and judgment against those who flaunt their sinfulness before the world as if God does not see. And we look at those people and we forget that we were still enemies of God when Jesus died for us. We were still enemies. We were weak. We were ungodly. And that was the right time for God to save us. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. See, the death of the son of God on the cross was the greatest demonstration of love the world has ever seen or will ever see. It was love for those that are hateful and enemies of God. And Jesus didn't just pick and choose who he, who he would die for. He didn't only die for the good. No, he died for the whole world. Go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these words. And he said, he, that's Jesus, he is the propitiation for our sin. He is the appeasing sacrifice before God for our sins. And not for ours only, John writes, but also for the sins of the whole world. What did Paul say? He died for the ungodly. While we were still weak, that was the right time for Jesus to die. Because he died for the ungodly. And our name used to be on that list of people that were enemies of God and hateful. 
Jesus died for people that even hated his father. Enemies of all that were good and true and honorable. He even died for those that killed him. That hated him. His own enemies. Go to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. Because we're grateful that that's the gospel story. Amen. That the love of God was so great, he didn't wait for us to get better and find a way to wash ourselves before him. No, he died while we were still hateful enemies, spewing violence and hatred towards God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The spirit that we see in those that we think and we are angry at and deserve God's wrath, that same spirit was the spirit we followed. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, was made alive. he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. See, the love of God is most clearly seen when it's compared to the sinful. The love of God needs to be explained and expressed even to those that are enemies of God right now. Just like you and I didn't do anything to be saved. We simply received what God had already done and what God had already said. And that brought us salvation through faith. It was all God and not us. In the same way, not only can we not lose our salvation because we didn't do anything to gain it, but those out there need to hear the same story. A lot of people struggle with the view of what the church thinks of them because they feel judged. When we don't have a place to judge. Because we were just like them. And we received the love of God freely. And that is the gospel. That God saw hateful, wicked, ungodly sinners, enemies of him, and loved us so much. He sent his son to die for us. And God is the one who exchanges enemies for friends. Look at verses 9 and 10 of Romans chapter 5 again. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Paul loves that phrase, much more. He uses it six times in this, ver- in this book. Much more shall we be saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Let's talk about that word reconciled for a moment. I'm going to call that the great exchange. What does it mean to be reconciled to God? Well, the first phrase reconciled, the word reconciled simply means this, to be made at peace with. To be made at peace with. Jesus tells us that if we're coming to worship at the altar and we have our gift, but at the moment as we're getting to worship, we remember that somebody is mad at us. Somebody's got something against us. Jesus says, leave your gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled with your brother or sister. That means make peace with them. Do what is necessary so that there's no more animosity between you two to make peace. But Jesus... But Jesus, through the Apostle Paul's pen, says we've already been reconciled. In fact, if we look at it, we'll see that reconciliation is past, present, and future. We're going to see that in just a moment, but I want to give you the the definition of this word reconciled, because it's really cool. And, And it's honestly, it's perfect for us. Those of us sitting in this room right now are at the some of the best people to understand this Greek word. Here's what it means. To exchange currency. Anybody ever done that before? Oh, come on. You can raise your hand. This is a participation event. All right, here we go. Good. We've all changed currency. Why? Because the home currency that we have is no good here. I don't care how much we have, but I can't go into 7-Eleven with my home currency and say, hey, I'd like that pack of gum. They'll look at the currency and say, that's no good here. You need to go change it. 
to the currency that is good here. That money that we have is weak. It's strengthless, powerless, just like we were. See, we used to live in this currency of this world, but that currency that we used to live in does not fit in the currency of the kingdom of heaven that we now belong. And God has exchanged the currency of what we used to use to now make us who we are now as citizens of heaven. He's given us currency for the kingdom. What does currency do? What does money do? What does wealth and values things that we own do? Well, it determines where we live if we have enough money. Some of us have agencies over us that determine how much money we have to have so that we can live here. We understand that. It determines what we can accomplish. Do we have enough money to do that? You know, husband and wife growing up, I grew up in a very poor family. I remember mom and dad all the time saying, do we have enough money to do that? Can we stop and get ice cream? Can we do this? It often determines our own perception of our world or the pe way people perceive us. The rich are a certain group. The poor are a certain group. And it provides us a feeling of comfort or safety or the lack thereof if we don't have it or we do. That's what money does in this world. We decide if we're happy or not happy based upon how much money we have in the bank or how much protection we have for our retirement and future and all that stuff. Those are the th currencies of this world. But God has exchanged that currency for who we are now in Christ. Now we live for Christ. We're here because it's God's will that we're here. It's his whim that we are able to serve where we serve. We follow him. We know that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And if he wants to do it, he will let us. We have been exchanged. And let's look at verses, Romans 5, verses 10 and 11. It's all three tenses are there. Paul writes, so if while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. We were reconciled, that's past tense. We are reconciled, that's present tense. Let's keep reading. More than that. We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That's present continuous, if you want to think of it that way. That's we have it now, and we're not going to lose it. That's now and the future. We've been exchanged. We have a much more not life now. Sure, we still think in terms of the realities of this world, but we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything that we have is from God. We're just stewards of it. We're supposed to be good managers using the mammon of this world for what purpose? To declare the glory of God. To make friends using the filthy lucre of this world so that those friends will greet us in their homes in heaven. To share the gospel. To tell people about the truth of who Jesus is. The Bible says we were reconciled. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. What is that talking about? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. We're going to spend an awful lot of time in 2 Corinthians 5 because that's a parallel passage of what we're talking about this morning. And it leads us to where Paul is going. It says we were reconciled. What does that mean? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the exchange. God saw us as sinful. He wanted us to be righteous, so he sent his son Jesus to exchange us and make us righteous through his blood. So now we live confidently knowing that we're God's, and what he wants to accomplish, we just love and trust that he will do it, and we want to be a part of it. Verse 10, we're now are reconciled. Now that we are reconciled, we'll be saved by his life. What does that mean? That means living in the grace of God. Look at verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. We know this from memory. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. What does that mean? It means our daily lives are now spent not judging people based upon the currency of this world what they do. But we judge people based upon the currency of are they a citizen of heaven or are they a future citizen of heaven? Because you know what? That's how Jesus viewed people. We're going to see that in a moment. But that really is how Jesus 
viewed people. Verse 11, we have now received reconciliation, so we rejoice in God. What does that mean? We rejoice in God. Every moment of every day, we rejoice in God, in the relationship we have with God, in the love relationship that the, God the Father has purchased for us by His Son. We focus on God. What is He doing around us and in us? Where's God at work? We see God's hand in everything, for He's always in control, and He loves us. And we desire to see God's glory spread to all people because that's the will of of God for this time period right now. There will come a time when we're in heaven with God and the new heaven and the new earth and all things will pass away. We're not there yet. God wants to use us to show others the exchange that we've received and help them understand, you know what? You're, you're, you're acceptable to God too. Doesn't matter how sinful you are, how weak you are, you can repent and receive the same thing that we received because we don't have to work for our salvation. Instead, God says, I've given you, my child, the ministry of reconciliation. That much more life is described in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 19. How do we live in the light of the gospel? We see how the gospel affects everything about us, our thoughts, our emotions, our actions, how we think of ourselves and how we think of others in the light of what God is doing. Paul writes it this way, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. That's Jesus. Therefore, all have died, and he, that is Jesus, died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him for their sake died and was raised. We are to no longer live for ourselves. Worried about our comfort, worried about anything in that realm. We live for Jesus. His love compels us, controls us, in how we speak to our spouse, how we speak to our children, how we speak to our teammates, how we speak to those that God has called us to reach and to share the gospel with. Our willingness to go, it's all wrapped up in who controls us, and that's the love poured into our hearts for the, from the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. We don't consider them based upon the currency of this world. Even though we once regarded Christ Jesus according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Here's how we regard people now. Are they our brother and sister in Christ, or are they a possible future brother or sister in Christ? If they're a believer, then we judge them anticipating what God is already doing in their hearts. We don't judge them according to the flesh and what they do, because we aren't supposed to hold them accountable to the sin. We'll see that in a moment. But instead, we're supposed to treat them the way God is treating us. And what is he doing? He's shaping us. We mess up all the time. And we go to God for grace and mercy in our time of need. And God says, you're my child. You're brothers and sisters. You should be treating each other that same way. We aren't supposed to keep track. Love keeps no record of wrong. Remember that? 1 Corinthians 13. Yet how often do we do that? Because we forgot that this salvation we received, we can't lose, and it was all God, and we are just beneficiaries of His grace. And those people that we're working with, those believers, they are beneficiaries of God's grace too. It wasn't based upon what they did. And so we are all just growing into maturity of Christ. And so I'm supposed to encourage them to be shaped by God. Yes, encourage them to rep repent and turn from ways in which are not honoring to God. But I'm supposed to encourage them and welcome them in the shaping process. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I look at my wife and I see a child of the king. I look at my brother and sister in Christ. I see a child of the king. Because that's how Jesus sees us. He sees us like he saw Gideon, who was hiding, threshing wheat in a wine press, and he says, mighty warrior, that's who you're going to be. 
when I'm done with you. That's the way we're supposed to see each other, too, in the light of the gospel. But what if they're not a believer? We judge them in anticipation of what God's going to do. Because, again, that's what Jesus did. Verse 18, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of showing the exchanged life and offering the exchanged life. That is, in Christ, God is reconciling, was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And then trusting to us the message of reconciliation. This is the hard part. This is the mature in Christ part. This is the master class part. This is the master class of the heart of Jesus who looked at the people that were nailing him to the cross and cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is the heart of Stephen who as he's getting hit with stones cries out and says, don't Hold this sin to their account. Yet when we see people who offend us or are even evil, flaunting their evil, we get upset. As if God needs our help. No. God has called us to not counting their trespasses against them, but see them as a future child of the king if they would just know the gospel. Because while we were still weak, while we were still ungodly, while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, that's the right time for God to show his gospel to us. And that's the ministry of reconciliation, not counting their trespasses against them. And I'll tell you the truth, the only way this is possible is through the power of God. It's God through us declaring the ministry of reconciliation. We just need to be willing To show the love of God. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I love that. Paul, in the middle of, of dictating this letter, he says, let me just stop and stop talking theology and just say, hey, if you're listening to this letter, if you're reading this letter, let me just tell you, be reconciled to God. It's already paid for. It's already available. It can be yours. You can be at peace with God and not fear the wrath to come anymore. You can receive this new life inside of you. You can receive this new way of thinking that when we suffer, we see it's a good thing because God is bringing us endurance and he's building our faith and our character. And we are hoping that one day we're going to be just like Jesus Filled with joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there's no law. That's available to you, Paul writes. Because Paul knew that everything he'd received, he didn't deserve. And so he was able to not count their trespasses against them. And that's what we've been called to do. In closing, look at James chapter 2. Verses 8 through 13. Those of you that are visitors, the last verse is going to be our benediction for this morning. But let me encourage you. Look at James chapter 2, a passage we don't often think about in respect to this. But let me show you that this is exactly what God's word is saying there. James chapter 2, starting with verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, what's the royal law? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, that means judging people according to what they do or don't do and based upon how you think of them, forgetting that the righteousness of man never, I'm sorry, the anger of man never brings about the righteousness of God. But if we show partiality, you are committing sin, James writes, and are convicted by the law as a transgressor because you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has been accountable to all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery is also the same one who said do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. And that's all of us, isn't it? We're all guilty of that. So speak and so act 
as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Speak and act in the exchanged life. The life that says, there's much more waiting for me because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. And there's much more for you available if you will give your life to Christ too. Speak and act as those who are judged under the law of liberty. Verse 13 is the key. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. But what? Mercy triumphs over judgment. Romans chapter 2, we read, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. So let me encourage you. When you're reading the news, if you're watching parades, watching people steal God's rainbow from the covenant of Noah and use it for other uses, don't get angry. Pray. Thank God for the salvation we've been given because you know what? We could be in that same parade. We could be in those same areas of the world doing the same things without Jesus Christ. Amen. But God rescued us from them. While we were still enemies and ungodly and unholy, separated from him. And God's mercy triumphed over his judgment. Amen. Let's pray. God, we love you. Father, thank you for this small glimpse of what it means, this bigger picture of living in under the light of the gospel. This good news that you revealed to us, even in our darkest times. Father, we don't know how long you will tarry before you return. And we know with anticipation, one day you will return. But until that day comes, God, your word is very clear. You are being patient because you don't want anyone else to perish. You want to offer your salvation to as many as will receive it. So God, use us. Not just with our words and with our print and with our films, but God, use our lives, the exchanged life. Help us know what it means to live with the currency of the kingdom in our pocket, trusting you and getting excited about what you're going to do in the lives of other people. That we only worry about an audience of one and what you're doing, Father, and, and how we are already pleasing to you through what Jesus Christ has done. So God, would you let your love truly be revealed? through your children because God we firmly believe as Paul said the hour is short and you're going to return soon may we be about the ministry of reconciliation Father for your glory we pray it's in the name of Jesus we ask Amen